Hello, my name is Sarai Castro and I'll be giving you a presentation on my research paper based on moon exploration, the space race and beyond. During this presentation, we'll look forward to answer three main questions. Why the moon? How we got to the moon? And what's next on lunar exploration? Let's start with the space race. During the technological the arms development of World War II, the Germans created the first object capable of reaching the space, called the V-2. It was designed as a vengeance weapon to attack Allied cities during the following bombings against German communities. It was designed by Dr. Werner von Braun. After the invasion of Germany in 1941, though, the United States, United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union captured the manufacturing facts of these rockets. While the personnel and Dr. von Braun himself surrendered to the American army, the Soviet Union took control over the facilities used to build these rockets. The Soviets used these facilities to build this Sputnik 1, which was made of aluminum alloy and had the shape of a sphere, and it would be set to become Earth's first artificial satellite. It was launched three months after the American, three months before the American response, which was the Explorer 1. Designed by Dr. Brown himself with a very different shape to the Sputnik 1. It was said to become the first U.S. Um, satellite and the first to carry science instruments. The victory of the Soviet Union in the first stage of the space race would become a trend given that in the next two missions, they were victorious against the United States. So the most predominant one was the Vostok 1 and the launch, and the launch with Yuri Gagarin, who would set to become the first human on space. Project Mercury, who was completing the final test of the time, wouldn't accomplish the same until a month later, when astronaut Alan Shepard became the first American in space. Then the Soviet Union turned its attention to the moon with Project Luna, which successfully crashed um, spacecraft into the lunar surface and became the first um, human artifact to reach another celestial body. And the United States decided to respond with Project Gemini, which was set to complete several specific missions in an effort to, to control and dominate what would be a future manned lunar mission. So the arrival to the moon had several setbacks. Among them were, the for the, for the Americans, the tragedy of Apollo 1 and the death of the three astronauts who would set to be on the mission. It imploded on the testing, on the testing facilities before, e before its even first flight. For the Soviets, however, it was a Soviet rocket disaster. They were building what was set to become the Earth's most powerful rocket and what would impulse their spacecraft to the moon. It exploded on a test launch. And the worst part was that it destroyed the equipment around it being developed, which would make sure that the Soviets wouldn't reach the moon anytime soon. Like I mentioned before, to reach the moon, it would be necessary to build the most powerful rocket on Earth. The, Amer the Americans um, designed the Saturn V as a response to this problem, and it was composed by three main stages. The first floor had five 5-1 engines consuming 2,000 tons of fuel in less than three minutes. That fuel was composed by kerosene, liquid oxygen, and liquid hydrogen. The second floor was composed by G2 engines that could be turned on and off and would allow the um, spacecraft to turn and to be able to change directions more easily. And the third floor was the most important one, composed by control, service model, and lunar model. It had the astronauts on board and also the instruments they would use to get to the moon, disengage, and come back to, to the spacecraft. In total, it had 110 mid meters in height and fully loaded, weighted almost 3,000 2000 tons, and about 2,700 of which correspond to fuel. The Americans then designed the Project Apollo with the specific mission of having a manned spacecraft reach the moon. This program achieved several flight and space milestones, like the Apollo 8, which became the first manned spacecraft to orbit a celestial body, the moon, and the Apollo 9 and 10, which were the first flight tests of the lunar model. Um, they basically practiced the engage and disengagement of the lunar model with control before the actual mission who would do it. And then the Apollo 11 was the mission designated to reach the lunar surface. It was composed by Neil Armstrong, which would be the commander, Michael Collins, the command of the model pilot, and the only one of the three men who, would, who was not set to do the moonwalking, and Buzz Aldrin, the lunar model pilot. The Apollo 11 mission profile will be composed by a mission profile similar to this. And the command, it fall into this, and 
it had several stages, all filled with complications. After the launch with the Saturn 11, uh, Saturn 11 had the, the responsibility to break away from the Earth, Earth's gravity. And it would, it would basically follow its path against the moon, against the moon until it, they would orbit it. Armstrong and Alton would disengage from control, land on the moon while Collins was continuing to orbit the moon. Um, Armstrong and Aldrin will do their lunar walking, come back to uh, control with Collins, and then go back to the moon and finally crash on the Pacific Ocean. After this, what happened? Well, the Apollo proved to be a complete success, and Aldrin and Armstrong were able to complete all of NASA's scientific goals for the mission and bring back precious um, lunar stones to the um, to, to Earth. Um, following several Apollo missions, went to the moon successfully and came back, all of which had a total of about 378, 3,072 kilograms of lunar material to Earth. And apart from the disaster of the Apollo 13 spacecraft, they were all successful. However, as the years went by and space travels was proved to be pretty dangerous, the public interest was lost. And also, the political interest was lost once the space race was over and the Soviet, U- the Soviet Union admitted its defeat and decided not to continue with the space race. Then the, then the federal financial support was lost. And the Apollo program was shut down and the trip soon stopped. So the main question would be, of course, when are we coming back? It's not as simple, but the next steps would be, first of all, f- figuring out the financing of the missions. The traditional way to do it is federal finances. So the government would be financing the trips to the moon and making it possible for NASA. Um, well, this is not totally available anymore. Actually, NASA is trying to get private investors to take pride on the United States space history and to invest on new trips to the moon, maybe by tourists, maybe not only by astronauts. And then unmanned missions have also been proved to be pretty successful, like the NASA's LRR mission, which is set to map the surface of the moon and figure out possible landing spots for future manned missions. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be very pleased to answer them. Astronomy can sometimes be a difficult subject to learn because it seems like astronomy isn't directly related to how humans operate, to our day-to-day activities, and the things that we do in our daily lives. But astronomy actually is related to things that we do in our daily lives. It exceeds the scientific realm of stars and moons and planets. Of course, all those things are interrelated and directly related to the things that we use in our day-to-day lives. But Sometimes it is difficult to see those connections. And in this presentation, I'll be explaining how things such as camera film and programming relates to the things that we do in our day-to-day lives, but uh, also examples of how directly astronomy is related to our lives. So the first example, we're actually going to start from the beginning and talk about the astronomical roots of the example that I'm going to give later on in the presentation. So let's start with talking about the sun. So the sun has several different layers to it, but we're going to focus in particular on the photosphere. The photosphere is the sun's outermost and the thinnest layer. It's only about 500 kilometers thick, and it makes up less than 1% of the sun's total radius. It can be observed, it could be observed by using telescopes, which were first invented by Galileo, a very famous Italian uh, 17th century astronomer. Now, um, when astronomers first began observing the outer layer, they started to notice these little seemingly dots on top of the sun, and they weren't sure what they were. There were a lot of different theories about what they could be, which included like dark clouds floating over the sun. As you can see in the picture, it can kind of look like that, or holes possibly in the sun, the smaller dots look more to that extent. In actuality, what these astronomers were witnessing were called sunspots, which are small spots that kind of just sit on top of the sun's photosphere. And the way that they were finally able to figure this out is in 1859, uh, a spectroscope was invented by Robert William Bunsen and Robert Kirchhoff, a chemist and physicist. And the spectroscope uh, was a mixture of a uh, telescope and um, with uh, a very special kind of telescope lens that was able to help them look at the sun. 
and determined that these were indeed sunspots. And sunspots were very important. They were important in the use of being able to, you know, track the rotation of the sun because they would use the sunspots as proof that the sun was in rotation. Now, uh, in the same century, a very famous camera company called Kodak was created. And what Kodak did was they used the same technology to create what is called the technical pan film. And technical pan is a black and white film. There's a picture of technical pan right at the top here, black and white film, uh, very efficient in taking pictures of the sun and other solar objects, you know, coming from that astronomical background. And also it was used in photo editorials. It was used by the army. Um, it had up to 25 times the, the zoom in quality of regular film because of, you know, it was very strong and uh, it was just very efficient and a very good uh, film that Kodak used. Uh, for the second example, we're going to be talking about fourth programming. If you look to the picture to your right, that's just a picture of what that coding looks like. And that's exactly what fourth is. It's a coding program that was began by Charles Moore. At first, it began as sort of a, a personal, professional, procedural thing. Um, his coding file was just very large and he wanted a way to condense it. So he ended up creating his own sort of coding. And this, uh, this coding, again, was just used for professional and personal, but it ended up being really efficient. So um, he was just a regular coder at the Smithsonian. He um, went on with his continued education and ended up eventually graduating from MIT. And once he did this, he got a job at um, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And there he continued to use his coding and it got so good to the point where it was picked up by his employer and he was able to use it in a way to help astronomers look through a telescope. It was very efficient. Several astronomers could look through the telescope at once um, and do several different functions with no interference no slowing up of the program, and it was very wonderful. Um, this program continued, like I said, to be improved upon and ended up being used by hundreds of astronomers around the world. You know, they heard of this program, and it was just, it was something really wonderful and spectacular that he did all on his own. A few years later, they brought on someone else to sort of help with the support of um, the code. Her name was Elizabeth Rather and she came in and she began to use the code and she saw how amazing it was. She was able to do things in one day with the fourth programming that would take at least a week with other programs. And she and Charles worked together to create Fourth Inc., which became the official um, company for this sort of code. And they went on to use this coding for different companies such as NASA Space, Space Flight Center, you know, still staying within the astronomy world, but also um, uh, the telephone companies and even Apple computers. You know, fourth programming is used in their Macs. That's why you'll see a picture of an original Mac PC to the right. And they begin to sell to individual consumers in the form of floppy disk. If you'll see a, a floppy disk to your right on the bottom, um, so yes, sport just became a, a, a very, a very big, um, and it still is a very big player in the industry today. And these two examples of both technical pan film and sport just go to show how astronomy is is really very related into the things that we do every day. Whether it's taking a picture or using the computer, astronomy is not as uh, far removed from um, us as, as a humanity, as a society, as we think. We usually think of planets and moons and stars being so far away from us and uh, a, a, a subject such as astronomy just being so far removed from us that how could it possibly relate to me? But it is very directly related. And um, I mean, as a whole, astronomy is the reason why some of the things that we use every day are as great and efficient as they are. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christian Boothman, and today I'm going to be presenting to you Life Beyond Our Earth. In today's presentation, we shall be discussing extraterrestrial life, research and discovery, and the potential ramifications of such discovery. So sit tight, and let's get right into this. Since the dawn of human civilization, we have always looked towards the stars, planets, and other various celestial bodies from our meager pale blue dot below. According to the ancients, 
who came long before us, they retained astronomical data and records about certain celestial bodies and tracked their movement. They were fascinated with the heavens. Even so, they still retained, for the most part, geocentric and anthropocentric views. Some in our contemporary age may retain these same views. Although the Earth may seem significant to us, compared to the magnificent scale of the cosmos and the vastness of space, Earth is simply an insignificant dot. This is portrayed by the photo taken by Voyager 1 on February 14, 1990. One question has pervaded the human psyche and consciousness like none other. Are we alone? In our contemporary space age, the answer to this question may come sooner than we thought. As technology increases exponentially each year, we have come closer and closer than we have before regarding extraterrestrial research and discovery. If such a discovery were made, what are the ramifications? I propose there will be certain social ramifications which regard religion and politics in human society. Another mission which shows humanity's technological advancement is NASA's Kepler mission. In 1961, a board of astronomers led by Frank Drake came up with various factors to an equation known as the Drake Equation. In effect, it determines the likelihood of extraterrestrial life on a planet. Various factors tie into the equation, such as the rate of stars which can support intelligent life, the rate of such stars with planetary systems, the rate of such planets which have an optimal environment for life, the rate of these planets which actually have life present, the rate of intelligent life emerging on these same planets, the rate of civilizations with detectable signals, and the amount of time these civilizations can release such detectable signals. Once all these factors are boiled down, it's estimated that there could be at most 15,785 advanced extraterrestrial civilizations in our home Milky Way alone. This doesn't even account for the universal scale of what may be out there. The Kepler mission sought to analyze these factors by surveying exoplanets. As a result, in 2009, the Kepler spacecraft was launched to search for exoplanets which could support the conditions for life. Although most of the exoplanets found were uninhabitable gas giants, thousands were distanced in a habitable zone, that is to say, in the Goldilocks zone between its central star and the planet which allows for a life-yielding climate, and also had an Earth-like size. The Kepler mission shows humanity's capabilities for gathering information about exoplanets through the use of unmanned spacecraft. This is a clear indicator of humanity's technological advancement and how we are advancing our own research about extraterrestrial life. Reflecting back to the Drake Equation, how would humanity respond if they found or encountered a sentient and advanced extraterrestrial civilization? If humanity were to encounter such a civilization, new policies would definitely have to be made in order to account for their existence. Perhaps it could be hostile towards humanity, and nations have to unite together for a common cause to resist a formidable threat. On the other hand, they could simply be peaceful towards humanity, which may lead to new trade agreements and cooperation with our new galactic neighbors. It is clear and evident that humanity has come a long way regarding technological advancement. We have sent various landers, rovers, and orbiters to other neighborhood planets. The ancients long ago would have never thought that humanity could put their mark upon the universe in stepping out towards the celestial bodies that they saw in awe and wonder. In 2020, NASA plans to collect various samples from Mars. These samples are called biosignatures. And what biosignatures are uh, is that they are certain evidence for life. For example, the evidence of water, the evidence of organic material, or whatever the case may be. They wish to collect these samples first on Mars and then send another rover within the next four to six years in order to send it back to Earth. Now then, there are four different test sites that would like to study regarding this upcoming mission. The first test site is the Columbia Hills. It contains certain hot spring deposits which show evidence of water. This hot spring, according to NASA, was active three billion years ago. Secondarily, we have the Gerizo River Delta, which contains residual clay, which also may be a sign of biosignatures. 
It also contains sedimentary rock, which infers the presence of water as well. Thirdly, we have the Northeast Sirtis, which is another area of interest to NASA. The reason being is that it contains bedrock layers which were supposed to have ancient aquatic organisms. Finally, the overlapping region between the Jarosa River Delta and the Northeast Sirtis, also known as the Midway, is another place of interest due to the characteristics of both regions. The fact that humanity can step out to Mars and analyze these various sites is a clear indicator of our technological advancement and how long we have gone to reach the point we are today. This same advancement is the key to discovering extraterrestrial life and furthers our research into the topic. As technological capabilities advance along with extraterrestrial research, the social ramifications for such discovery must be addressed. Religion is held dear to billions around the world. It is central to various nations, backgrounds, cultures, traditions, and people groups. Nonetheless, how would an extraterrestrial discovery infect religion? According to ancient philosophies and religions, they retained an anthropocentric and geocentric worldview. As a result, secular critics of religion claim that religion would be negatively affected by an extraterrestrial discovery and would cause a religious crisis worldwide. But, according to Ted Peters, a theologian and a professor of the Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, the exact opposite would occur. Ted Peters created the Peters Extraterrestrial Intelligence Religious Crisis Survey, which asked 1,300 participants from various religious traditions and backgrounds to offer their responses to a potential extraterrestrial discovery. Remarkably, the majority of these participants did not believe that their religious convictions would be challenged in the wake of such a discovery. Moreover, this is because religious traditions retain a cosmic worldview which extends beyond the Earth. The scope of creation extends beyond the pale blue dot. It extends to the stars and planets seen in the heavens. Therefore, it would not be difficult for these religious adherents to integrate the existence of extraterrestrial life into their cosmological worldviews. Although the central tenets and main concepts of religion will not be challenged by an extraterrestrial discovery, the same cannot be said for politics. NASA and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute held a conference. This conference aimed to answer how aeronautic and astronomical institutions would approach a discovery of microbial life forms on Mars. Three separate approaches were contrived at this conference. The first, and the most aggressive, cataloging. Within the cataloging approach, humanity would collect samples of certain microbial life forms while using the rest of the planet for human industry, that is to say, colonization. The second approach, and most pacified approach, is the nature preserve, which states that humanity should not interfere with the natural native fauna of the planet but instead allow it to dwell there without any sort of human disturbance. The third approach, which is a sort of mix between cataloging nature preserve, is the zoo approach, which states that humanity should delegate certain regions for nature preserves or zoos for these microbial life forms while allowing the other regions to be delegated for human industry. Not only does an extraterrestrial discovery have an effect on aeronautic and astronomical industries, it also has an effect on international policy. Can certain nations claim certain planetary regions or an entire planet in its entirety? How will territories be annexed and according to what international laws? Will these microbial life forms be under the subjugation of these nations? Can each nation decide its approach? For example, cataloging nature preserves or zoos, what international policies would be in place, and not even international, on a cosmic or planetary scale? How can we decide which nations have certain authority and how that authority can be utilized? Regardless of your approach or convictions about how the situation should be handled, it is evident that a potential extraterrestrial discovery will indeed have an impact on international policy and human politics 
as a whole, even beyond the scope of Earth. I'm Christian, and the topic of my research presentation is the future of humanity in outer space. I chose this topic since it is something that's always been very interesting to me ever since I was a child, and I'm sure that it's been something that's interesting to everyone as well. Right, so to give a little background on the history of humanity in space already, we of course have to start with the first missions, which were Sputnik 1, Vostok 1, and Explorer 1. Sputnik 1 being the first satellite ever sent into space, of course, by the Soviet Union. And then we had Explorer 1, which was the first American satellite to ever be sent into outer space. And then, of course, there was Vostok 1, which was the first human to ever be in outer space. And these, of course, were just the first steps of humanity ever even thinking of going into outer space, which were, of course, followed by our mo most momentous space program, which was Apollo, during which, of course, Apollo 11 happened, which was the first ever space mission to put humans on a different foreign object or even anything other than the Earth. And since then, we've never been back or on to any other planet or moon. This, of course, was followed by subsequent missions, which were still which we're still in the process of, such as missions like the James Webb Space Telescope, the Cassini mission, the Kepler Space Telescope, and so on. And of course, we don't have plans to stop there, obviously. We plan to keep on going, perhaps step on other planets, such as Mars. Outer space is not exactly suitable for astronauts or any kind of human. The human body is extremely fragile, and changes in the environment of outer space as compared to Earth just completely change everything for us. So of course, if we can't send actual humans to other planets to explore, we have other options. And those other options are mostly robots, which could be sent to explore planets such as Venus, Mercury, Mars. Well, they're already exploring Mars. And of course, with all this data gathered by robots, we could compile data and eventually send humans back into outer space so that we could finally explore and colonize those planets. So if we want to send astronauts into outer space, of course, we'll have to prepare them for what they're going to face. This graphic by the Australian Academy of Science showcases just a few of the body parts that will be affected if we send astronauts into outer space. Of course, the environment will be completely alien to the astronauts as there's going to be probably no gravity or less or more gravity if we're sending them to planets or moons. Radiation in the travel of an astronaut would be extremely dangerous to their body. And of course, they won't be on Earth anymore, so their bodies will have to adapt to a different system of time. And all of these issues of the fragility of the human body will be issues that we'll have to face if we want to send people into outer space. So the body of an astronaut is not the only thing we have to worry about if we're thinking about sending people into outer space. Of course, the human mind will probably suffer the most if we were to send people into outer space. If we want to ever send people to faraway places, such as Mars or even the moons of other planets or other planets themselves, we'll of course have to send astronauts who will spend time in spaceships for who knows how long. It could be months, years. During this time, those astronauts will be totally isolated. They'll be unable to socialize with other people perhaps having only three or four or even less astronauts to spend their days with. And of course, they'll be confined to extremely small spaces of their spaceship, so it will feel like solitary confinement. And of course, if a person is trapped like this for months and years on end, mental behavioral issues could arise that could put the mission in jeopardy. Of course, solutions to this problem have already been researched since we sent astronauts to the moon where they had to spend a lot of time by themselves. 
But if we're to send people to further away places, of course, we'll have to factor in that longer time period. And as of now, there's not really much in this category that there is a solution to, but the most important solution would probably be exercise and creational time for the astronauts. So this graphic by Tomoya Mori shows us the minimum requirements that it would take to put a human on the moon. It shows us some key features such as oxygen that we would need, the drinking water we would require, food, the water to make food. So once we figured out how to actually send people to other planets and moons, we'll of course need to know how to set up colonies in those barren places. So many of the options that have actually been presented as theories you've probably seen in science fiction and other works of fiction. And they include satellite colonies, such as the ISS, where you could just put a satellite around a planet or a moon and have people live on the satellite. My favorite and probably least likely to happen is, of course, terraforming, which would be to completely reconstruct a planet's environment from the ground up and make it more like the Earth so that we can just live there. And lastly, the most viable and most probable to happen colony would be those fully enclosed colonies, such as the research stations in Antarctica, where, where scientists are able to live completely isolated from the barren cold of Antarctica. This is a fictional depiction of what Mars would look like if we terraformed it to be habitable by humans. And as you can see, it looks nothing like the red planet that we know. This, of course, is purely fictional and will probably never happen, as it is something that's, of course, extremely expensive and would take an extremely long time to accomplish. Before I begin, I want to preface my presentation by laying out the general structure of the original research paper. The research paper was divided into two main parts, the reasons for and the challenges in colonizing Mars. In the first part, I detail the driving forces behind the Mars Exploration Project and look at why the project garners the support it does. In the second part, I focus on the challenges faced in the progression of the project. This includes logistics such as the time and cost of the project, to talking about prospects such as terraforming Mars, and solving Mars' other issues for human habitation. A full understanding of the Mars project cannot be reached without first understanding the core reasons as to why it came to be. At the center of more commonly cited reasons for settling Mars lies the fact of Earth's finite nature. That is to say, there are limited resources and a lot of competition for these limited resources. With the way things currently stand, Trends of increasing environmental pressures put the sustainability of life on Earth at risk. This is especially evident with regards to climate change and ozone depletion. Global temperatures have been steadily rising due to an increase in greenhouse gases, and the UV warding ozone layer is being thinned due to the interaction between CFCs and ozone molecules. Now this isn't to say that all the reasons for colonizing Mars are so dire. In fact, there is also a lot to be learned from a trip to Mars. One way that sending humans to Mars could help develop science is through comparative planetology. Specifically, when a geologist wants to learn about the history of Earth, he or she can dig into sedimentary rock layers to effectively reveal the past of the planet. As it currently stands, the only sources of information from the surface of Mars comes from a few rovers' surface-level analyses. The logical progression to this would be to have researchers on Mars who are able to collect more thorough samples. The way this rather standard planetology then changes into comparative planetology comes from this information possibly being used in comparison with samples on Earth to learn more about both planets. In this sense, there is stuff that can be learned about Earth by learning about Mars, which gives this project all the more viability. Now that the reasons for pursuing the project are out of the way, we can now talk about challenges that come before the plan's completion. It's no secret that Mars is not a place where humans can live unhampered. As it stands, its atmosphere is over 100 times thinner than that of Earth's and is 96% carbon dioxide. To solve this, there would have to be large-scale change to the characteristics of the planet, or in other words, the planet would have to be terraformed. If the composition and thickness of the atmosphere could be changed, 
Subsidiary issues such as the Great Temperature Range of Mars could be by and large resolved. Another issue to be addressed is that of colony self-sufficiency. It goes without saying that if any humans were left on Mars, their colony would have to be capable of surviving without external help. To this degree, NASA has worked on yielding synthetically grown red romaine on the International Space Station with just LEDs, soil, and water. Although the technology has not yet been perfected to operating conditions where there is no usable soil, NASA has been looking to implement hydroponic growth solutions, which means they are working on crop growth with only light and nutrient-rich water. It goes without saying that to successfully colonize Mars would come with more problems than just those mentioned before. The cost of completing the Mars Exploration Project is a problem of its own, but this issue is dwarfed by the potential for conflict that interplanetary territory disputes have. Fortunately, a potential solution to this issue came about in the form of the Outer Space Treaty, a document that was signed by all major world powers, which held that territory in space is international territory. While this may seem to be a really idealistic solution since there is no space police force to enforce it, the document has held up for over 50 years, so only time will tell if it is a proper fix to this rather large issue. In summary, the Mars Exploration Project came to be as a result of reasons as dire as environmental pressures to reasons as simple as a drive for knowledge. As would be expected of an endeavor of this scale, there are many challenges in the way of its completion. There are smaller issues such as gathering funds, which is concrete in nature and quantifiable, and there are much larger problems such as terraforming a planet, of which the goals were abstract and the methods ambiguous. Regardless of these obstacles, progress is being made in the directions that would allow what was once no more than a fantasy become reality.